Carla Homolka is one of Canada's most infamous female serial killers. She committed several heinous crimes against teenage girls. She even offered her own sister's virginity as a gift to her boyfriend before they got married. She later went on to kill her own sister. Carla would only serve 12 years for the crimes she committed, which was dubbed by the Canadian press as the deal with the devil. There's a lot to unpack. Let's get into it. Listener discretion is advised. Carla Leanne Hamolka was born on the 4th of May 1970 in Port Credit, Ontario, Canada. Her father, a Czechoslovakian immigrant, worked as a travelling salesman. He often got drunk and would fight with her mother. In her teens, Carla loved to draw and she had a love of animals and even worked in a pet shop. She was a very bright student and was liked by her teachers. However, her peers remember Carla as being bossy and although she claimed to love animals, she once threw her friend's hamster out the window, which resulted in its death. Carla also loved to read books like The Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew and became obsessed with crime. However, as she got older, she seemed to love to scare her friends and became interested in the occult and would call up spirits with her friends. At high school, when it came to fashion, she was known as a non-conformist and didn't really care what others thought of her. She dated a boy by the name of Doug and admitted to having sex and taking drugs with Doug. She would also fantasise about weird situations related to death and once attempted to cut herself with a knife. At the age of 17, she met Paul Bernardo at a convention in Toronto. There was an instant attraction. They had sex the same night and would find that they shared the same sick sexual desires. Paul Bernardo was born in 1964 in Scarborough, a district of Ontario, Canada. His mother and father's marriage was an unhappy one and his father Kenneth would later face charges of peeping and paedophilia. He also molested Paul's sister. Despite his broken home, Paul was considered to be a happy child. However, at the age of 10, during his time at Boy Scouts, he became obsessed with making fires. In 1981, at the age of 16, Paul would suffer two major setbacks. One was his mother telling him that Kenneth was in fact not his biological father. His behaviour towards his mum changed after that and he would call her a whore and a slut. She would reciprocate and call him a bastard. Then his first girlfriend Nadine would leave him for one of his friends. Paul became a salesman for Amway whose sales culture deeply influenced him. He bought books and tapes from motivational speakers and would apply what he had learnt to young women he met in bars and clubs seducing many successfully. However, by the time he began attending the University of Toronto, Paul had developed some seriously sick, dark sexual fantasies. One of which was to build a virgin farm where he could breed virgin girls so he could assault them. He enjoyed degrading his dates and threatened to kill his girlfriends if they ever revealed the treatment he subjected them to. In 1987, Paul graduated from college and found a job with Price Waterhouse as a junior accountant. Paul and Carla met in a hotel restaurant in Scarborough where Carla was attending a pet conference. Carla, 17, and Paul, 23, were instantly attracted to each other and had sex the same night. He would visit Carla twice a week and would, over time, start controlling her whole life, telling her how to dress, what to eat. He would often call her fat and ugly. However, Carla would submit to Paul's ways and would encourage his sexual behaviour. In May 1987, Scarborough was plagued by a series of horrific crimes and the nature of the beatings and what the victims endured clearly indicated they were dealing with a sexually sadistic offender. On the 4th of May 1987, a 21-year-old was brutally attacked near her parents' home. 
there would be many more assaults to come, around 19 over a period of almost five years. He would threaten the victims to discourage them from going to the police. The newspapers began to warn of the Scarborough attacker. Paul would follow them home and almost all of the attacks would take place outside. However, one woman was attacked in her home. By March 1988, police had set up a task force to apprehend the so-called Scarborough rapist. Despite the amount of physical evidence and a composite sketch which for some reason was not shown to the public, the investigation went nowhere. Carla was fully aware of what Paul was doing. One of the victims told the police that Carla was present during the attack filming the assault. However, these allegations were ignored by the police. In 1990, the police finally decided to show the composite sketch to the public and hundreds of tips came flooding in. Friends and ex-girlfriends of Paul also contacted the police. However, the police were so overwhelmed by the amount of tips received that they were unable to follow up. In November 1990, two detectives visited Paul and took samples of his blood, saliva and hair, but they were not tested for another two years. This was the second time the police had questioned Paul, the first being in 1987, when he had been called in on a previous rape investigation, but he was never interviewed. Paul was obsessed with virgins, and Carla's 15-year-old sister Tammy became the focus of his obsession. He would spy on her. Carla and Paul would both hatch a plan to attack her. Their first attack was on the 24th of July 1990, where Carla would lace her sister's meal with Valium, which she had stolen from her workplace. However, Tammy woke up before Paul could attack her. They tried again on the 23rd of December of that same year. Carla described this as gifting her sister's virginity to Paul for Christmas. This time they drugged Tammy with the animal tranquilizer halothane, which was soaked in a rag and held over Tammy's nose and mouth. Tammy began to vomit and she stopped breathing. They tried and failed to revive her, so they dressed her, cleaned up all the evidence, moved her back to her bedroom and called 911. However, she died in hospital. Tammy had a visible chemical burn mark on her face. However, her death was ruled as accidental. Paul was caught stroking Tammy's hair at the funeral. And in 1993, when Tammy's body was exhumed, a picture of the couple was found in the coffin. Carla and Paul moved to Port Dalhousie. They continued with their sick fantasies by role-playing the sexual encounters between Paul and Tammy. Carla would play the role of her sister and would even wear her sister's clothes. On the 7th of June 1991, Carla invited a girl to their new home. She was 15 years old. They drugged and assaulted this young girl. However, when she woke up the next morning, she felt a little sick and left without realising what Paul and Carla had done to her the night before. A week later, on the 15th of June, 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey missed her curfew after attending a friend's wake and was locked out of her house. Paul was in the area looking for licence plates to steal. He saw Leslie and approached her, saying that he wanted to break into a neighbour's house. Leslie wasn't afraid and asked him if he had a cigarette. He said he had some in his car. They walked to the car. Paul forced her in the car and blindfolded her. Paul and Carla videotaped them torturing and abusing Leslie while they listened to music. Paul even told Leslie that she was doing a good job. After they murdered Leslie, they kept her body in the basement while they had dinner with Carla's family upstairs. They later dismembered her and encased her body parts in cement, which they dumped in Lake Gibson. 
at least one of the blocks were unable to sink and was found by a father and son on a fishing expedition on the 29th of June, the same day of Paul and Carla's wedding. On the 16th of April, Paul and Carla kidnapped 15-year-old Kristen French as she was leaving school. Several people witnessed the abduction. Paul and Carla tortured this poor young girl for three days. She was severely beaten before being strangled. Again, they left her body in their home while they dined with Carla's parents. They later washed and cut her hair and then threw her remains in a ditch. Paul was interviewed by two officers a month after Kristen's murder. Despite Paul admitting that he had previously been interviewed by the police in connection with the Scarborough attacks, they did not consider him a suspect. Soon after, Paul and Carla changed their name to Teal, which is also the surname of a serial killer in the 1988 film Criminal Law. And he will do it again soon if he isn't stopped. On the 27th of December 1992, Paul beat the hell out of Carla with a flashlight, leaving her with bruises, a broken rib and two black eyes. Despite the state of her face, on the 4th of January 1993, she returned to work. She told her colleagues that she had been in a car accident, but they didn't believe her and informed her parents. Her parents insisted that she go to hospital. However, they literally had to force her out of the house as she ran back in the house desperately looking for something. She claimed to be a battered spouse and filed charges against Paul. Paul was arrested and the samples that he had provided two years earlier were finally tested and he was identified as a Scarborough rapist. Carla and Paul were arrested for the murders of their victims in 1993. Carla sought full immunity in exchange for her cooperation, which was denied. She was given a week to accept a 12-year sentence for manslaughter as well as other crimes. If she declined, she would be charged with two counts of first-degree murder and one count of second-degree murder. This deal should never have been made. The police obtained a search warrant which was restricted and only one videotape at that time was found. On the 14th of May 1993, Carla's plea bargain was finalised and she began giving statements to the police. She told the police that Paul boasted that he had assaulted at least 30 women. She also told the police that Paul used to beat, manipulate and force her to take part in the horrific acts against those murdered. At that time, as you know, um, he kept on pushing and pushing and pushing and I said, finally I said, okay. And thinking that it would it wouldn't be you know, it would just be one time, that's it. It would shut him up and he would stop bothering me and stop hurting me. Being physically and verbally abusive to me. He he wasn't loving. He acted like he didn't care that we got married. Um and he told me that he was a Scarborough racist. And it just was not like the kind of wedding night that those things were happening. Those burns are possibly chemical in nature and anti-mortem. The only chemical that was near her was the halophane. It was not placed on her face directly. It was held, as I said, like this, this far away. Hamoka is lying to police. A videotape of the assault recovered later clearly shows Hamoka holding the soaked cloth either very close to or directly on Tammy's face. Her feet were tied with that electrical um, electrical cord that he used to kill Leslie. And there was electrical cord around her neck and then he strangled her after he was done. It stands out really clear in my mind because the night before I left him, he did the exact same thing to me, only he didn't kill me. The victim was matter of fact when she toured police through her Bayview Avenue home where two teenagers were murdered. She had chosen to dress as a schoolgirl. Hamoka's response to being back in one of the rooms where Leslie Mahaffey was attacked was to ask police about her furniture. Can you answer a question for me? Was any of the furniture damaged as a result of the investigation? 
Not that I'm aware of, no. And upstairs in the bathroom where they cleansed Kristen French's body of evidence, Amolka inquired after her perfume samples. You're saying Paul's lawyer took a number of articles from him? Well, from what I understand, his lawyer took basically everything. This is where we carried it down, carried Leslie down the stairs. And in the basement where Leslie Mahaffey was dismembered, she had yet another inquiry on behalf of her other sister, Lori. Can I ask you a question? Can I I'm have, afraid I can't answer Can I have that questions. book? My sister wants it. Um, Why does that have to stay here? That has to stay here for okay. now, but we can make those arrangements. Okay, thank you. And my Christmas tree. Paul was tried for the murders of Kristen and Leslie in 1995. His trial included detailed testimony from Carla and videotapes of the assault. Paul testified that the deaths were accidental, however later claiming that his wife was the actual killer. On the 1st of September 1995, Paul was convicted of two first-degree murders and two aggravated assaults. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison without the possibility of parole. He is classed as a dangerous offender, which means he is unlikely to ever be released. Carla's plea bargain was heavily criticised by many Canadians as Paul's first defence lawyer had withheld videotapes for 17 months, which clearly showed Carla assaulting and enjoying the attacks on the young victims, including her sister. We were a good team, you know. We're the best team, you know. We were great, man. United we stand, together we fall. How could it fall for us, okay? You keep standing, pal. Alan, it's amazing to me that this woman, Homolka, a serial killer, is set to go free next week. What the hey is going on? Three well, it, murders that we know of. Well, in, uh, in the eyes of the Canadian justice system, she is, uh, she is guilty of two counts of manslaughter, not of murder. And she is getting out of prison after 12 years for her parts and uh, her husband, Paul Bernardo's killings of Kristen French and Leslie Mahaffey, two teens from this area, and in the fatal drug rape of her own sister, Tammy Hamalka. And Alan, what about the video aspect of the rapes and murders? Well, uh, Paul Bernardo and Carla Hamalka videotaped the, uh, their rapes, uh, not the murders, but the rapes of the victims. And these videotapes didn't surface uh, until well after uh, the February 15th, 1993 arrest of Paul Bernardo. Uh, Carla Homolka struck a deal with prosecutors to, for 12 years in prison ex in exchange for her testimony against Paul Bernardo at, at his trial. Uh, the videotapes uh, surfaced about 17 months later when uh, Paul Bernardo's lawyer, uh, first lawyer quit the case and then uh, prosecutors struck a deal with Homolka to not prosecute her uh, after another rape came up on the videotapes, uh, the rape of uh, a girl who was known as Jane Doe who was also 15 years old at the time. You know, uh, to Daniel Horowitz, the defense attorney sat on these videos of these girls, school girls, being raped, including Homolka's own little sister. You know, Nancy, it is such a difficult ethical issue. Oh, please. Well, when you're an attorney, you have an, uh, you've sworn an oath, so you know you're obligated to protect your client no matter how heinous the client is. Now, if you hide evidence, you're breaking the law. But if you just know where it is and you shut your mouth, you really are doing your job. So sometimes you as a defense attorney hurt inside so badly oh, yeah. that you just got to do your job. And you know what, Nancy? It hurts, we doesn't count? it, Daniel? It well, hurts. It does, but we count on people like you, tough-nosed prosecutors, to find the evidence, and that's, oh, there has to be a balance. Lord. Here in the studio with me, Dr. Patricia Saunders. You know what? She got a free ride on this. She lured her own little sister. Catch this. She gave Ellie, wasn't it Halcyon? She put in her sister's eggnog at Christmas so the sister would be knocked out because her husband co-defendant wanted a virgin for Christmas authorities didn't even realize this woman you're looking at her helped to drug and rape her own little sister now you know what Dr. Patricia Saunders she got a light deal because of her looks and because she's a woman I'm just telling you like it is but I don't believe this guy brainwashed her 
Absolutely not, Nancy. She has gotten away with murder times three and then some. This woman is most likely a psychopath, a serial sexual predator. We don't like to think about women that way. No, we don't. About 1% of the population in this country are female psychopaths. Now, to give you a, an example of how what a psychopath this woman is, she wrote a letter to her friend at the time of her wedding saying she was really annoyed with her parents because they were selfishly grieving her sister's death and they wouldn't give her enough money for her wedding and gave it to the funeral instead. You know, don't you just hate that, Tim Danson, when your parents dare to spend their hard-earned money on your little sister's funeral after you helped kill her? The tapes were considered crucial evidence and the prosecutors said they would never have agreed to the plea bargain if they had seen the tapes. Paul has been kept in segregation at the Kingston Penitentiary for his own safety. He's been attacked and harassed, punched in the face, and in June of 1999, five convicts tried storming his segregation range. Unfortunately, riot squad used gas to disperse them. Such a shame. And barely room to move in cell 121A, where the convicted killer contemplates his life sentence behind bars. This is a rare glimpse into how a protective custody prisoner serves his time. The monotonous routine includes meals delivered to his cell, and ever fastidious Bernardo washes his cutlery, even the gravy off his meat. Completely isolated, Bernardo is locked behind iron bars covered in plexiglass for his own protection from the 18 other inmates in the unit. One can't escape the irony of the killer who used video so cruelly to document the suffering of his victims, himself now a prisoner captured on camera 24 hours a day. As for Carla, well, she was released after serving her 12-year sentence. She remarried, has three children, and seems to be living her life. Carla got away with murder, including that of her sister. However, she is still questioned by the press from time to time. Carla does not appear in any way, shape or form to show any remorse. The notorious schoolgirl killer is an occasional volunteer at a Montreal school. City News has learned Carla Homolka has been in the classroom and on a field trip. Dominic Fazioli tells us why the school didn't do a background check. Carla Homolka is one of Canada's most notorious criminals. Along with her then-husband, Paul Bernardo, she played a role in the sex killings of two schoolgirls and her 15-year-old sister. Since her release from prison, parents have opposed her presence outside schools, including her children's schools. Last year, there was a backlash in Chattagay, and now she's facing resistance in Montreal's NDG district. Can I talk to you for a second? No, you can't. Since September, Homolka has been a regular fixture at Greaves Adventist Academy, a private Christian school. We don't want her there. We don't want her in the school. Lily is a concerned parent at the NDG school. She doesn't want her face shown. She says Homolka does more than just drop off and pick up her kids. She claims Homolka occasionally volunteers at the school. Several sources connected with the school say that on March 22nd, Amolka helped supervise a group of kindergarten students during a field trip to the Montreal Science Center. How would you feel knowing that your child is interacting with a, with a person who's a serial killer? It's not right. Those same sources say Hamolka has even been inside the school from time to time. She's even brought her dog into the classroom for children to pet. She's not supposed to be there. Why is she allowed to be in the school Lily says many parents have spoken to the school principal, but nothing has changed. We spoke with Hamolka last week. Carla, can I ask you a question? Do you volunteer or work at the school? Who are you? You know who I am. No, I don't know who I am. Who are you? I'm a news reporter. Well, good for you. By law, before anyone can have regular contact with children in Quebec schools, they are required to undergo a criminal background check. Our questions to the school about if this protocol was followed were not answered. But the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada who runs the school says the school board was fully aware of who Hamolka is and that she is not a regular volunteer and can never be alone with children in school or churches. My lawyer will be in contact with you. Thank you, Carla. A statement sent to us Tuesday afternoon reads in part, 
The Quebec Conference of Seventh-day Adventists and the administration of Greaves Adventist Academy are committed to providing quality education and enriching learning experiences to its students. While we work through the concerns stated by parents and other stakeholders, we welcome those associated with the school to contact the Quebec Conference Office of Education. Dominic Fazioli, Breakfast Television, Montreal. As you can see, she's clearly not humble. Hopefully Carla and Paul will reunite in hell.